Well, welcome everybody to uh, Solar First Saturday, uh, brought to you by Imagine Solar. And um, my name is uh, Michael Kuhn. I'm the founder of Imagine Solar, and we've been involved in uh, advocacy work and education work uh, for a good uh, 10 years now. Uh, we also do uh, engineering advisory services. Uh, but today, it's about um, what's happening in um, uh, the Texas area in regards to what the Clean Tech uh, organization does for us. Uh, and then we're gonna have uh, uh, a presenter that's gonna talk about the universe of solar, the solar universe, Tom, Tom Mortman. So our first speaker is going to be Andrea Ricarte, and she's the executive director of Clean Tex, and she's going to tell us about the work that Clean Tex is doing. And uh, and I'd like to bring her up, and let's give her a round of applause for. Thank you. All right. Thank you for having me. This is going to be kind of a brief overview of Clean Tech, who we are, our role in economic development, cluster development, and the broader clean tech landscape in Austin. So I'm here mostly because Tom Wortman serves on our board of directors, and so I kind of piggybacked on his presentation to let you know more about Clean Tech and how you can use us as a resource. So, quick bit of history. I guess I'll just kind of walk you through what I'm going to present. So kind of who I am, how I got into the energy sector, brief overview of cluster theory and how that applies to Austin clean techs, the work that we're doing. Uh, what is clean tech? So this is the question I get probably the most uh, beyond renewable energy. What is defined as clean technology? Uh, why Austin? Why our ecosystem is so conducive to innovation and why we have such strong leadership in clean technology and clean energy? And then kind of the bootstrapped history of clean techs. We are an Austin startup story. We're just a non-for-profit startup that was spun out of the Austin Technology Incubator. Clean Tech 2.0, some uh, initiatives that we started over the past year that we're going to develop over the course of the next several years, especially in economic development. And then two of our main projects right now, one is Smart Cities and International uh, Partners and International Business. We've got this great partnership going with Europe to foster international trade and clean technology between Texas, the Netherlands, Flanders, France, and Germany. And then the Defense Energy Center of Excellence, which is another public-private partnership that's emerging and a big initiative that Clean Tech is involved with. Okay, so the next slide is just kind of um, talking about a little bit about who I am, my inspiration for being in this field. I have a very non-conventional background in, in how I got into the field of energy, but uh, growing up, my father's from Ecuador, my parents lived in Mexico for a while where my oldest brother was born. I'm the youngest of four kids and we were always encouraged to travel and go to exotic places and sustainability kind of became this core focus of how I was raised, especially because I just spent a lot of my life kind of going and visiting my brother when he was living in Mexico and Brazil and Costa Rica and doing sustainable development projects. So I'm an old school environmentalist and that's kind of how I came at energy. And then I started my career through the Teach for America program. I'd studied natural resource economics, energy, environment, school, and then went on to teach earth science in the South Bronx and uh, Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brooklyn. So my background is in environmental science, policy, natural resource economics, education. All right, so the next slide just kind of talks about this idea of a cluster. So if you want to become a country music star, you would go to Nashville, Tennessee. If you want to make it in entertainment, you'd go to Hollywood. Nashville is a country music cluster. Hollywood is an entertainment cluster. So the idea of a cluster is a region with a concentration of businesses within a certain industry. And that's in the broadest sense what a cluster is. And then a Harvard economist named Michael Porter came up with this cluster theory of economic development, which has become really, po uh, really popular, kind of looking at how we can engineer these environments to be really conducive to fostering innovation in a certain industry. So, Austin is a really great example of a clean technology cluster, and so a lot of what Clean Tech does is promoting that, developing that, and helping understand how we fit within other uh, clean energy hubs across North America. So we are a cluster initiative or a cluster development group, which basically means we're focused not on policy, but on fostering collaboration, public-private partnerships between government, academia, industry, etc. cetera. Um, and so that's kind of, the, the broad overview of what a cluster is, cluster theory, and then the way that it applies to Austin, which is actually really exciting and not a lot of people realize, 
we have evolved to be one of the most successful clean technology clusters in North America. So you have regions like San Diego, Silicon Valley, Boston, Chicago, and then Austin that are really the leaders on the map of where we have the strongest clean energy hubs. So much so that a lot of these initiatives clean techs has developed have uh, evolved as a result of the interest we've had in Austin's clean tech cluster. So we frequently get delegations from other countries or other cities who are coming to Austin and saying, I want to learn more about what you did in the clean energy energy space, how you got started, why you're such a center of innovation. So that's kind of how cluster theory applies to Austin and the ecosystem that we have here. So really quick overview of what is clean technology. I get this question a lot. You all are familiar with solar, so you're probably familiar with this term. But in the broadest sense, we define clean technology, well this is my personal definition, basically any technology or service that provides fuel or electricity with minimal environmental impact and greenhouse gas emissions throughout the entire life cycle of that resource. So renewable power generation, obvious example. Uh, something that increases the energy or water efficiency of an existing technology or infrastructure reduces their emissions. And then finally, something that results in a behavioral change whose collective impact redu uh, reduces the carbon footprint of that community, that can be considered a clean technology as well. So an exam example of that would be like Ride Scout, this company that aggregates all of your traffic options into one app and then allows for people to make better use of public transportation, car to go, et cetera, and reduces their carbon footprint. So we would consider that a clean technology company. So clean tax focuses on the broadest spectrum of clean technology companies. So we work with renewable power generation, solar, wind, smart grid technologies, the utilities, energy efficiency. So everything in that space. We are an umbrella organization that works with all these different kinds of companies, which is uh, central to the, defini the definition of a cluster group. So we're not bucketed into one sector necessarily. So not just focused on solar or wind, et cetera. <laughs> Go to the next slide. Oh. All right. So. This is probably my favorite thing, if you can go back one. Sorry. Why Austin? Yes. Go back. There we go. OK, so this is my favorite part of my job and what I love talking about most. So this is why Austin is such a strong leader in this field. So first of all, we have the Austin Technology Incubator, which just celebrated its 25th anniversary. Within the Austin Technology Incubator, they focus on growing companies in high tech, IT wireless, biotech, and also clean tech. This is actually the first, the clean energy incubator at ATI was the first clean energy incubator in the entire country. So that happened first in Austin. 25 years ago, ATI was the only incubator in the game. Now we have you know, Capital Factory and all these other incubators, which is really good for our innovation and startup ecosystem. But as far as clean energy is concerned, we were really the first to do that and to specifically incubate companies that are in the clean energy space. Austin Energy is a pretty progressive utility. We have really aggressive renewable portfolio standards. Uh, they have a lot of forward-thinking projects in terms of deploying electric vehicle charging infrastructure, uh, getting more distributed ge generation, and incorporating more renewables into the grid. So they're a great utility that we have the opportunity to work with. And then we have the Austin Chamber of Commerce. So our Chamber of Commerce, as far as we know, is the only Chamber of Commerce in the States that has one position that's specifically dedicated to recruiting clean tech companies to come to Austin. And so that's actually a partnership with Austin Energy. Via Austin Energy, they pay the salary of this director of clean energy and power technology. And we work really closely with that person to basically steal companies from other regions and get them to join our cluster. And we're pretty good at it. So Pike Powers Lab, this is the large smart grid demonstration project that was the first of its kind, also started in Austin, the Miller development. The Pecan Street project, it was originally called, it basically is one of the largest concentrations of solar PV and electric vehicles in the nation. And then the Pecan Street project basically took uh, these devices called e-gauges and they, uh, they install them in buildings, they measure all the energy consumption within the buildings, and they provide uh, one minute and you know 15 minute data around their energy use. And so a really great example of uh, this smart grid demonstration project that helps us understand human behavior and how that relates to energy choices. And then we have the University of Texas at Austin. So dollar per dollar, we do more energy research at the University of Texas than any other university in the entire world. And that's pretty awesome. So we're a big partner of theirs. Uh, they're incubating a lot, they're sending a lot of companies through the Austin Technology Incubator. A lot of research is coming out of there. Really great stuff going on. 
And then we just have um, this story of all these companies that have either started in the region, moved to the region, or grown their brand in our region. And we have a really broad diversity of the kinds of companies that make up our clusters. So we have a lot of solar, a lot of uh, wind in Texas, a lot of the developers, Heliovolt, which is a, a thin film solar panel manufacturer. We have you know, just a, a wide, wide range of companies in the broader clean tech sector. And then we have uh, a lot of attention around Austin and that cool factor, things like South by Southwest Eco that bring a high concentration of people here to, to learn about what we're doing in the clean energy and sustainability space. So that's kind of why Austin is really, you know, it's a mix of all these different players. Clean tech very much sits at the nexus of all these different stakeholders and our job is to kind of act as the connective tissue that gets everyone to collaborate, promotes what's going on, and then pitches new ideas for uh, public-private partnerships and, and fosters collaboration. Next slide, please. Okay, so what is clean tech? So cluster development, clean technology, Austin, Texas. We can go to the next slide. What we're best known for are our events and our networking platform. So Clean Techs was spun out of the Austin Technology Incubator in 2007, and the idea was that clean energy is one of the most important growth sectors in our regional economy, and we need one central organization to be the convener to bring together all of these different companies and stakeholders to you know, get to know one another, uh, network, collaborate, and really build out the ecosystem and define what that looks like. So we started as an events platform and ATI, Austin Energy, and the Austin Chamber of Commerce came together to found this organization and they said, we're not gonna develop internally our own little clean tech sector, but our segment rather, but we'll join forces and create a separate entity that can serve the needs of the broader clean energy community. So started with uh, doing events pretty regularly, so panel discussions, presentations, happy hours, just as a, a resource for the industry for people to network and convene. We started putting out a newsletter that kind of went over all the energy headlines, told the story of clean energy in Texas, had a recap of all the events going on, and so became this resource for the industry. So started off with just events and networking, and we were able to build up a brand. And then very recently, over the course of the past two years, Clean Tex has undergone a massive transformation, and it's a just really cool story, but much of that is attributed to some changeover in leadership. So Mitch Jacobson, who runs the Clean Energy Incubator, became our chairman of the board a couple years ago. Uh, so we brought in some new board members, some new insights and flavor to clean techs, and then hired this guy, John King, who's now at the Austin Chamber, who's my predecessor, who uh, was the executive director of clean techs before me. So basically what happened with Clean Techs, it was always run part-time by one executive director who was secretly working for the Austin Technology Incubator, and so it was kind of a side project. Until John King came along, they hired him part-time, but he treated it like a full-time job and basically said, you know, don't hire me if you want someone to run events, but if you want someone to really make this into a cluster development organization, that's what I want to take this organization and move it towards. And we were able to do that because we had a really strong network. We have about 5,000 people who subscribe to our newsletter and hundreds of people who come out to our events. So we have a really strong brand and we have really great friendships with other groups that are doing different things in the policy space, et cetera. So we don't compete with the other, you know, Solar Austin and TRIA and all these other groups that are playing important roles in the renewable space. We want to partner with them, promote what they're doing because it serves everyone to kind of have that umbrella organization that's letting everyone know what's going on. So long story short, we can go to the next slide. Um, I met John and Mitch and they kind of laid out a vision for what they wanted to do with clean techs, how they wanted to, to develop it into a stronger organization. I just moved to Austin a year and a half ago and I didn't know a single person in the industry, but I was just aggressively networking, met them, kind of drank the Kool-Aid, wanted to get involved. And so we became, uh, we came up with this idea that uh, I would do business development for them and we would basically just hit the ground running and hustle until we could raise enough money to build out a staff and, and build the organization. And so this is what we did. So over the course of you know several months, I basically was volunteering until we could raise enough money to make it a proper job for me. Um, and so John and I, you know, getting paid part-time, working full-time, just endlessly reaching out to a bunch of companies to support what we were doing, leaning on our founders to give us more support, uh, surveying the industry and figuring out the niche that we could fill, what we could do economic development-wise. And this became, uh, we were really successful. We were able to get a ton of support. And so finally, um, there was this domino effect in the industry where Jose Becerra left the Chamber of Commerce, John King took his place, I moved up to executive director, and so now I'm the first full-time employee the organization has ever had, and now we're hiring even more people. So that's kind of our bootstrapped history and how Cleantechs 
was able to bolster its resources and, and be able to do more in the economic development space, which is what I'll talk about next. So if you can go to the next slide. The first project that we launched was called the Industry Inventory. So in order to really build out the clean tech economy, we had to first catalog and find out all the companies that exist in the space, and this had never been done before. So we launched this massive research project going off the Chamber of Commerce's list, going off of you know, Google searches, et cetera, and we basically set out to define every single company in our clean technology cluster. So in solar, wind, smart grid, smart home, et cetera. And what we found was actually really impressive. So when the, the Chamber of Commerce created this position to recruit clean energy companies to Texas in about 2006, at that time, there were only about 35 companies in the game in the broader clean tech sector. We just finished the industry inventory. And so in that span of, you know, not so many years, we now have more than 250 companies that make up our cluster. And so we are not only one of the fastest growing cities in America, we are one of the fastest growing clean energy hubs in America. And so we're about to publish that on our website and you can go and see a map of all the different companies within each industry and then the directory of all the business listings. And then uh, if you can go to the next slide, just two more uh, initiatives that we're working on in the economic development space. There's this whole partners and in international business project that we were able to take on basically um, a group of companies and utilities in the Netherlands and Flanders had these innovation scouts that go all over the world identifying clean technologies they can deploy on their grids and in the process they started to identify all these different hubs and they went to Korea, California, Texas, all these different places and they chose Austin as the strongest clean tech hub that they wanted to form a partnership with and so they came here a couple times, they signed some MOUs between their utilities and Austin Energy, their research institutions and the University of Texas, um, and then Pecan Street and their research consortia. And then they hired clean techs to basically say, okay, we want to collaborate. What does that look like? How do we do an information exchange? How do we get projects off the ground? And so the, at the end goal is to foster international trade between Texas and the Netherlands and Flanders. And now it's grown to encompass uh, France and Germany and some other countries. So that's a massive project we're working on and kind of how it's getting started. We're doing engineer exchanges. So they're sending engineers from their utilities to come work at Austin Energy, learn about what we're doing in the smart grid space and electric vehicle charging, all of that. We're doing student exchanges. Researchers are teaming up to apply for grants to do joint research. And then we'll have companies call us and say, hey, I have this technology. I want to do a pilot project in the school. We'll go out, look for a school that can fit that model. And we're trying to help them deploy their technology here and vice versa. So that's that project. And if you go to the next slide, another big initiative that you'll hear about very, very soon is something called the Defense Energy Center of Excellence. So we threw in partnership with uh, CTSI uh, what was called the Defense Energy Summit. And the idea was that Texas has all of these resources in terms of you know, the veteran population, the clean energy hub. We are a legacy energy state, very much the heart of energy in America. We also, you know, between Fort Hood and San Antonio and Camp Mabry and College Station have all these military resources. And so the idea was to launch this Ener Defense Energy Summit to talk about our region's capabilities in terms of serving as a test bed for technology commercialization for the warfighter as it applies to energy. And so we threw this summit, we had about 650 people attend, most of which are from out of state. And then that was kind of starting the groundswell for this larger initiative, which is now underway. We're getting some seed funds funding to do this big public-private partnership to develop the Defense Energy Center of Excellence here in Texas. So you'll hear a lot more about this huge economic development play. Clean Tax is involved with this uh, very much. So that, the international trade projects, we have a lot going on. If you go to the next slide, this is just kind of a, an overview of the programming that we're doing and kind of what I do for my day job. So we do have a lot of events. That's one thing that we're known for. And so we do, you know, peer networking, clean energy beers. We'll do power lunch once a month where we have a presentation at the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we do a couple summits and partner on, you know, things for South by Southwest, South by Southwest Eco. We do our own, you know, clean text forum, panel discussions and whatnot. So we have a lot going on. Every month we have at least, you know, anywhere from two to three events. Uh, whether it's peer networking or educational. And then we have an executive education series. So we'll have a short course that'll be announced soon. That's the future of energy, which is gonna be taught by Rod, uh, Roger Duncan, who used to run Austin Energy. And he'll be talking about the future of energy as it applies to the built environment, transportation, uh, and then electricity and power. And then creating climate wealth, working with the Carbon War Room to get that class underway. Pecan Street's gonna teach some classes. 
And so we have all of that, and then I'm also working with local schools on uh, deploying technology <coughs> and helping with curriculum development because it's very important as a former teacher to kind of go back and do something with schools. Um, and then finally, the economic development stuff. So the Smart Cities Partners International Business, uh, DECO, the Defense Energy Center of Excellence, the Industry Inventory Project to catalog all the companies, keep that up to date. And then uh, company recruitment, we work with uh, Pflugerville and the Austin Chamber to recruit companies to our region, work with the Austin Technology Incubator to support the startups that are being incubated at ATI, and then also fund projects like promotional films. Clean Tech San Diego did a film talking about their innovation ecosystem and why they're such a strong clean energy hub, and it got you know, a ton of views, a ton of press, and so we're doing the same for Austin to you know, create a film to show the world why we are such strong leaders in this field. Um, and then I think the last slide is just my contact information. Um, thank you so much, Imagine Solar, for the opportunity to, to talk about this and all of you for, for coming here. We have a phenomenal newsletter. If um, you go to our website, we send it out once a week and it has just all the energy headlines, all of the events, company updates, uh, conferences, resources. And we are very much here to serve as a resource for the industry. And so, you know, we're all, we're very easy to get a hold of. Just, you know, reply to any of the newsletters, come to any of our events. If there's anything we can do to help you, connect you, or support you, that's the whole reason that we exist. Thank you. I just want to say, Andrea is an excellent example of young leadership in the clean energy field. And it's actually to our great benefit here in Austin that she has uh, made the migration from uh, the Northeast and joined us here. And, um, and as a, uh, an old guy, old generation, I'm very happy to see a new generation of leadership like Andrea is displaying here. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you today. Thank you. Uh, next on our agenda, uh, we have Tom Ortman. Tom Ortman is the founder and principal of Concurrent Design, and he'll tell you, I'm sure, a little bit of a background about what they do, but Tom's been a, a good friend. Uh, he's in uh, kind of my generation, I think, and, uh, uh, but he's an example of, uh, of uh, leadership uh, in clean energy space, and he's been very active in that for a long, long time now, doing engineering work and uh, advocacy type of work. And he's made it uh, his uh, mission to really understand the technologies involved in photovoltaics. And so his uh, presentation today is the result of a lot of research that he has done. And I believe he calls it uh, the solar universe. Let's have a round of applause for Tom Ortman. Thank you. So the, the discussion today is going to uh, very vaguely revolve around this, what I call the solar universe. And, and uh, I would like to present this to Michael and you can hang that on your wall. You've got one there already. This is an update. We continue to change it. The universe continues Well, thank to you grow. so much, John. So, Excellent. Uh, all right. So we're gonna, we're gonna work on that. Uh, thank you for having us out. Okay. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, I would invite all of you guys in the cheap seats in the back. There's seats up front. You may want to get something closer because there's a lot of stuff to see on these slides. Uh, so this presentation is, uh, nominally an hour and I can speak fast and, and condense it and I just didn't want to skip too much. So if you need to leave, of course, just go on ahead. Um, also, this is made for you guys. So if you've got questions, please just shout out, raise your hand, interrupt at any time. Let's go through your questions instead of waiting for the end of the discussion, okay? So uh, this uh, clicker has, ooh, that was a faster response yeah, time than I expected. I made a switch. Oh, good. So this is just a tiny little bit about me. I'm the founder of Concurrent Design. I've spent a lot of time in the semiconductor industry. That led me naturally into the solar industry as far as manufacturing processes and understanding of semiconductor <laughs> devices. And uh, got very involved in the clean energy industry, the solar energy industry, and some of the Chamber of Commerce activities. So a tiny little bit about us. Uh, we make big boxes of sheet metal with things behind them. And uh, there's all kinds of things going on. Behind those on the left is semi. On the right is solar equipment for applied materials. We also make test equipment and then solar products. These are some of the projects I'm most fond of and proud of. These are uh, photovoltaic systems. The top right is concentrating photovoltaics. That's a 30 kilowatt system. And the one on the left is uh, providing power to a winery in the Napa Valley because they wanted to go green, go solar. 
but they had no place to put their solar because the rooftop wasn't big enough. They were not going to pull out grape vines to put in solar, so they asked, can you put it on the pond? The installer, SPG Solar from uh, Marin County, found us on the web and asked if we could help them develop a system to go on a lake. Uh, we're usually behind the scenes. Nobody hears about us because we're the guys that are the engineering department that's making a lot of stuff that companies like Applied Materials might sell. But every once in a while, some of our work gets on the cover of magazines, and then we get to have a little bit of a, of a pat on the back. Uh, these are a few of our customers, our, our client list. And uh, we are specifically trying to move our business, which is engineering design services of commercial equipment, in the direction of solar energy, clean energy technology development. So today's discussion, I want to talk about this, what I call the universe of solar energy. And I call it that because it's way bigger than most people think. Way bigger. And it touches so many parts of our lives, so many areas of, uh, of the world in ways that I hope I give a little bit of uh, imparting that idea when you guys uh, are finished here today. So we're going to ask the question, what is solar energy? I'm going to ask you to think about it differently than perhaps what you think about it today. And what are the technologies? Why are there so many of them? Uh, what's the best one? Well, that's a really hard question. Uh, which technology is best for me and why? And it depends on what. So what is solar energy? You guys in this room are all very familiar with this scene. Bunch of solar modules sitting on a guy's roof. No news there. You're probably familiar with this, a bunch of modules sitting on a commercial roof. This happens to be the uh, ACC campus in South Austin here, or uh, this one parking garage installations over next to the University of Texas uh, football stadium. You get uh, cute little solar installations like this that's out of applied materials on 290, or this is the Weberville plant, 30 megawatt plant, and this has a, a dual axis or a single axis uh, uh, tracking system on this we'll talk about more later. So you're kind of familiar with those things. There's not a lot of news there. So when I ask the question, what is solar energy? And I want you to think about it differently. What about this? Anybody recognize that? Sorry? Google solar thermal. It is not what I would call solar thermals, what I would call CSP, concentrated solar power. This is Solucar PS10 in Andalusia, Spain. I like to say Andalusia. Uh, this is a 10 megawatt system, and to me, uh, a good crisp image of that is just about the most beautiful thing in the world of solar energy. What about that? There's, there's some solar energy at play for you. How about this one? Did you ever think about this as solar energy? And spend a couple of seconds thinking about just how important that solar energy is to that family living in that part of the world and how many people live in that situation. What about this? You don't often think about solar-powered flight. What about this? Is that solar energy? Anybody venture a guess? Hydroelectric power? You bet you that's solar energy. You bet your life that's solar energy. What about this one? Is that solar energy? Think about it. We could carry this discussion on to the coal and oil and natural gas discussions, but the guys in the back of the room might have something to say about that, so we'll let that one go. Um, this uh, graph discusses energy in a whole different vantage point. This is the most wonderful graph I've ever seen in my life. You can go to the uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab, print this thing out. This is the entire energy flow of the United States of America on one slide. It is magnificent. On the left side, you have all the energy sources. You guys can't read it. So I'll just sort of go through here a little bit. Down here, uh, I can't read it either. But this is petroleum, biomass, coal, natural gas. And I can't read these. The top one is solar. That number is 0.11 quads, quadrillion BTUs. Let's compare that to coal, because I can read that. That's 20. So 0.1 to 20. And if you look at coal, most of coal goes into electricity generation as does most of solar energy. Um, so 20 to 0 0.1, that number has been growing tremendously. And just last week, I noted that that number got up to 0 0.63. So that is a, uh, you can break that down into percentages, but that is an indication of the entire United States energy flow. And I, I literally have this thing posted on my wall about that big, and I've spent hours just looking at it and thinking about it. 
So again, solar energy, what is it? Well, here's another way to slice that question, look at it a different way. In one second, our sun produces enough energy to meet the current needs of the entire Earth for half a million years. One second, half a million years. Now that's kind of a fuzzy bit of logic there because you got the sun sitting out here and the Earth sitting out here. The sun produces energy, sends it in every direction. It doesn't all get to the Earth. But what about the energy that does get to the Earth? Um, you've got uh, energy that starts out in the uh, outer, you know, out, outer space and then goes through our atmosphere. And about 70% of that actually gets down here to the Earth. And these are the numbers. So extraterrestrial insulation, 1,366 watts per square meter. You've got a certain percentage of that is visible, about half visible, half infrared, a little percentage in ultraviolet. But down here on the Earth, now we've got about 1,000 watts per square meter. I like to think about that as if I've got a square meter, I can take 10 old-fashioned 100 watt incandescent light bulbs and put them into that square meter and run them all day long that the sun shines. That's a lot of energy. And that hits our planet every day, all day that the sun shines, all over the world. And so this just screams opportunity. Okay, um, Alicia, can we go, do we skip a slide? No, okay, go ahead. Okay, so this slide here. If there's anything that you guys take with you today, please take this slide with you. This is the most important visual I can leave with you guys. This slide is put together by Richard Perez from the State University of New York at Albany, and he has sort of cataloged energy and put it onto one single slide. Whereas that last slide I talked about was all the United States, this slide is the entire planet. This is all of the energy on the entire planet. Over here on the right-hand side, we have the uh, finite resources, coal, 900 um, uh, terawatt years of coal available on our planet. We've got uranium up here, petroleum, natural gas. These are finite resources. This is how much we have. We use, right here, 2009 world energy consumption in terawatt years per year is 16. 16 terawatt years of energy. This is coal. So divide 16 into 90, 900, you can figure out how much energy there is on the whole planet and when you're gonna run out. These numbers, of course, change, fracking, things change like that, but these are finite. Then you've got this list right here. These are the renewables. So starting with a tiny one, you've got tide energy, and I'm kind of surprised at how tiny tidal energy is, but you know that's the size that we use today. That's available in tides, that's geothermal, that's hydropower biomass, uh, this is ocean thermal electric currents, and we've got 25 to 70 terawatt years of energy available in wind every year. And we use 16. We've got 25 to 70, we use 16, power the whole planet on wind, piece of cake, infrastructure, that's a detail, right? So, what's missing here? This big honkin' circle, this big honkin' ridiculously large circle which represents solar energy, which happens to come in at 23,000 units, and we need 16. 23,000, we need 16. Please take that home, tell your kids. That's the lesson for today. So let's look at that a little bit closer to home. Uh, this three terawatt square in the middle, you could fit that into the um, panhandle of Texas and power the entire United States of America. The 20 terawatt square, pretty much cover Texas, pick up some vocal Oklahoma, nobody would notice, and you'd power the entire world. That's solar energy. Here is sort of the world today in terms of solar resources. Germany on the left is the world leader in solar, solar energy capture and utilization. And uh, they are way ahead of everybody. The darkness of those colors, and there's a scale here, I can't read the numbers, but the the darkness of those numbers indicates how much solar energy there actually is based upon you know, where they are in um, latitude, longitude, latitude, latitude, and um, based upon things like weather patterns and such, right? So there's Germany, 
and they are the world leader in solar. This is the United States. The darker the color, the more energy. What does that tell you if Germany is the world leader? What does that tell you about Texas? So here's a little bit of data, and this is from uh, Ernst & Young. This is the Renewable Energy Attractiveness Index. Don't you love that? The Attractiveness <laughs> Index. Well, Texas is number one because we have long-term wind and solar that are basically off the charts. We're not even close to the next guys. So what is solar energy? Let's slice it a different way. You guys are familiar with these solar modules, and, and what are those solar modules based upon? Solar cells that are made of silicon, OK? So silicon is right here. So silicon is the basis of this, but what else is, is important in that cell? I can't hear you guys. Boron. Thank you. Boron and phosphorus, OK? So silicon, as it turns out, has eight valence electrons. You guys will recall that from high school chemistry. Eight valence electrons. It gets into a crystalline lattice. Everything is crystalline. Everything is connected up two to two to two to two. It's a very stable crystal, and it doesn't want to do anything. So you put in these, um, these uh, doping elements, these semiconducting uh, cheats on here, boron and phosphorus, and you create what essentially is a, a seven uh, valence electron and a nine valence electron crystalline structure embedded in those, those, those silicon atoms that have eight. And you've created holes and um, uh, positive and negative capabilities for electrons to flow because there's now there's some, some, some flow patterns available because there's some holes in there. So if you think about all of the technologies, and this slide is actually a touch ahead, but silicon is what you guys work with every day. These are all silicon, and silicon is sand. We're not going to run out of sand, not going to run out of silicon. This is great. But there are other technologies. Right down the street is heliovolt. They do SIGs, copper, indium, gallium, arsenide. Okay, and so it's a valence electron game. You've heard of first solar, they make thin film, that's cadmium, and tellurium, cad tel. So again, it is a, a chemistry valence electron game. There are, are plenty of other technologies that exist. I, IBM is working on one which I, I think is zinc sulfur, not positive of the sulfur part, but I know the zinc part. And the reason is because zinc is plentiful and available just well, everywhere. Whereas some of these things, cadmium, um, indium, these things are not quite as readily available. Silicon, it's sand. So realistically, it all comes back to here as to what these technologies are. So um, you've seen this a lot. Uh, probably don't need to touch on that one. Uh, this one, if you spend any time in this industry, sort of on the technology side, you've seen this graph until you're, you're sick and tired of it. But uh, if you haven't seen it, it's actually a really, really important graph because every one of these lines represents a whole different technology, different than this one right here. So that one is crystalline silicon. And so crystalline silicon cells with a single crystal, a mono crystal or a thick film silicon. So this one here basically is the um, is the crystalline, I can't read the numbers, but uh, it looks like about 25% would be what we would call a hero cell, the absolute best that you know, has been measured so far. And these numbers change all the time, and you can see this is not the most up-to-date slide. Um, you look at some of these up here, we're up to about 43.5% conversion efficiency for other technologies, gallium arsenide. Uh, can we go back one slide, please? There's a whole, uh, and one more, please. There's um, something called 3-5 technology. So 3 and 5, gallium and arsenide. OK, you can go forward too. The, um, the gallium arsenide is a whole different kind of photovoltaic. It's not silicon-based at all. It is a whole different thing. And you can get 43.5% conversion efficiency hero cells today. And you can buy commercially 39% gallium arsenide cells today. But they ain't cheap. They're made to go into outer space. And the companies who are using them here today on terrestrial applications have to find creative ways to make that business case work. And we'll talk about that more in a little bit. So each one of these things represents a whole different technology, different applications, different reasons to exist, different uh, characteristics. Some of these things work great in, in the sun. Some of them work 
pretty darn good when there's not a lot of sun. Overcast days, when you're not facing into direct sunlight, you have low light, diffuse light, early morning light. Okay, I've, I've watched the, the, the meters on solar systems after the sun goes down, I've watched the meter still making energy because of the potential for the low light diffuse light. So that's actually pretty important for all kinds of applications. The company down the street, Heliobolt, they are in the uh, SIGS area. So that's this one, which uh, I think is, is right here. So this has not changed much in the last uh, 10 years or so, but it holds a lot of promise because it's got a 20% rating. And if you can do it with thin films, you use less material, it costs less money. And if you can get it to 20%, that's a really good deal. And that's what Heliobolt's trying to do down the street. This is a slide that discusses uh, breaking that down different ways. And so the different technologies um, and different approaches and then different substrates here. So all substrates are not silicon. Some are glass, some are stainless steel, some are ribbon, some are flexible, all kinds of substrates. Cost in this is important. Uh, as you can see from 1980 to 2013, it has dropped about 95%, and from the 1970s, solar has gone down 98% in cost. And that has sort of bottomed out as average uh, sales prices have, have moderated and even ticked up just a, a tiny bit uh, at my last uh, observation of that. Um, but what you're going to see is balance of system costs will continue to go down. The Germans are crazy way ahead of us in BOS. You guys know what BOS is. There are other people I talk to who don't know what that is. You guys know what that is. So they have dramatically reduced the cost of the balance of system. Just something like you know the application forms and the, and the permitting is way easier, cheaper over there because they're doing it smarter than we are. So there's a lot of room for improvement on that. So what is solar energy? It's irradiance. You collect it, you reflect it, you refract it, you use it, you do something productive and valuable with it. So now I'm going to talk about those technologies a little bit closer to home and then start to wander further around this universe. So photovoltaics, uh, standard issue photovoltaics. This guy right here, you're all familiar with this. There's not an awful lot of news here. Um, what's the difference in this one and this one? Anybody quickly tell me? Monopoly. Thank you. And you know that the one on the right is mono because? The, uh, the what? It's a solid piece. It's a solid piece, and you can see the cutouts. They, they make those in uh, six or eight inch wafers, and they, they slice this, this perfect crystal. And what's left here is that little arc. It's, uh, what's the term for that? Uh, I forget the term, but it's a, it's, it's a square, but there's a rounded corner on it. And that's how you can tell that those are monocrystalline uh, silicon modules. And these are typically going to be higher efficiency than these, which are polycrystalline. And because they're, they're polycrystals, they're not monocrystals. The monocrystal is more efficient because it's a perfect crystal. The polycrystal, and you've got all these grain boundaries that that electron has to fight its way through to get to be collected current. So the monocrystal is, is a more efficient module. And the, and the world leaders, North Austin, Sun Power Corporation, I think you can buy a 23.1% conversion efficient module today. They use, they use this. A lot of guys use this. What about this one up here? Anybody recognize what that is? Uh, that's, a, that's a thin film module, OK? And you can tell it's a thin film module, well, a couple of ways. The first clue to me is that it's on a glass-on-glass a -glass, uh, basis. It doesn't have the aluminum frame that is, is common for these modules. It doesn't necessarily make it so, but just the uniformity of the finish on it, it, uh, it tells me that that's a thin film module. So uh, these also come in other kinds of shapes. These are, I think this is GAF, and they make these roofing shingles. And they are photovoltaic roofing shingles. So uh, I was discussing BIPV here earlier. And uh, this is an example of built-in photovoltaics. We'll touch on that a little bit more. But um, they don't have to be this shape. And I guarantee you, I promise you, this shape is going away because this is not the future. Things like this are much more the future. So uh, it comes like this. This is a, uh, a flexible substrate that the, uh, um, I believe that these are, um, 
um, amorphous silicon. And uh, this is a flexible substrate that's got a plastic backing to it. And you unroll these things and you put them on your standing seam roof and they just fill up all the seams. And a uh, different way to slice that same cat. So uh, here are all kinds of end user uh, products. I'm going to come back to that a little bit more. Uh, so that's photovoltaics, and you guys know all that stuff about photovoltaics. So racking, you're used to you're used to racking, you're used to stuff like this, where you've got your aluminum frame, you put it on your aluminum standoff, and you 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 screw the thing down. Okay, so no no big. Uh, news there it goes on the guy's roof wherever his roof pitches kind of sort of that's where his solar panels are pitched as well and you're just kind of stuck with that uh, other racking situations this is that solar system that we developed for these guys out in the uh, Napa Valley so same basic idea only instead of sitting on somebody's roof now it's sitting on your on your pond and oh by the way these guys at SPG found all kinds of ways to make value out of this proposition one of those is that you save water because if you cover it up, it's not going to evaporate as fast. Wow, ain't that a big deal. While we're on the subject of water, I want to make a state of sentence and have you guys carry it with you forever. Photovoltaics does not require water. Photovoltaics does not require water. And if you think about that, that's enormously huge. Go look at how much water a coal-fired power plant uses, a nuclear power plant, okay? Go, go check out what that means. So uh, racking systems come in lots of different flavors. Uh, these start to become two-axis and three-axis tracking systems. So I don't know here uh, if, if Imagine Solar gets into some of these things. Uh, anybody know what a first axis adds to the harvest of your solar energy? So you add one axis and it tracks from the east to the west as the sun goes by, you get 30% more energy harvest. Boom, just like that. 30% more energy harvest than what you had on a, on a static racking system. You add a second axis so that it changes as you go from the winter solstice to the summer solstice and back again you get another 10%. That's a big deal. All you gotta do is prove out the math that says my tracking system costs less than the energy that I gain, and then you have a winning combination. <coughs> this again is Weberville. Weberville uses a single axis tracking system, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that this would be west, that's east, there is a, an axis right here, and these solar panels rotate every single day. There is a, a big line that goes through here that has a link, and there's one motor that will drive like, I don't know, 10 or 20 of these, of these big long rows of, uh, of solar modules. So with that, they're able to capture 30% more energy harvest by tracking it daily east to west. So tracking is actually a pretty important thing. It's not just some aluminum stuff you, you bolt to. Uh, inverters. Uh, inverters are an important part of this whole solar universe and, and what that means. Today we have uh, AC to DC inverters and you've seen these kind of things uh, a lot. This is routine. Nothing magic about these except that they keep getting better. The, uh, the highest efficiencies, I'm pretty sure around 99%. Michael, have you seen 99%? Okay. So that counts. When I started looking at these things, they were in the 90, 92, 94%, 99%. So that's a big improvement. Uh, they come in all different shapes and sizes, of course. Uh, the top left is utility scale. Uh, they go down into much smaller for residential. Here's one, another local company, Ideal Power. Uh, this is a 30 kilowatt in the old school. This is Ideal Powers. So they've made huge strides just in terms of the size of some of these things. And I know in my house, the size of the inverter was actually important because I just didn't have the, the space on the side of my house to put the inverter. Um, microinverters are becoming a bigger deal. In my solar system at my office, I had to put microinverters on it. You all know what a microinverter is, right? Everybody? Nobody? Question? Okay. Uh, microinverter takes that DC power from the module, turns it into an AC power, and it syncs up to the grid. So these microinverters, and the left is solar bridge, that's what we're using. Uh, they, in our case, are matching a 208 volt uh, three phase AC power. And I'm using the microinverters because we've got all kinds of shading that goes on. We've got the building which will shade these. There's on a, on a carport out front. 
and there's trees. And so as, as, the, as the sun changes throughout the year, the shading implications uh, have a big effect on what is, uh, is the results of the microinverters an important part of our selection process there. Uh, we've also got DC to DC optimizers, so that it's sort of doing the same thing as a microinverter, only it keeps it in, in the DC realm and doesn't change to, to AC. So to me, one of the important and interesting things about this whole thing is we produce DC power from the sun. We take our DC right out of the thin air, we create this, this DC voltage, we connect to the grid, we bring it into the house, we bring it to our TV, we rectify it back into DC, <laughs> and we watch our TV. We bring it into our house, and we plug in our laptop, and we rectify that AC power, and we turn it into DC. And if you think about every single thing in your house, what do you need AC for? Can you get a DC motor? Okay. So yeah, I mean today in your house, your big uses are your your, um, your refrigeration, uh, your compressors for your refrigerator and your freezer, um, fan motors are RAC, the motors for your air conditioning system, of course, are RAC, but they don't have to be, okay? And if you go over and talk to the guys at the Pike Powers Lab, the Con Street uh, uh, group, they are running a 48 volt DC system in their offices, so they can take their solar power, pipe it in, run their 48 volt DC solid state lighting system, okay? and run other, other DC um, loads. You don't have to go and become an inverted uh, power from DC to AC. And that, oh by the way, is a significant part of the future. So all of that that we've talked about, that's PV. And you guys know PV, you see it every day, you work with the Jonas mm -hmm. Band. CPV, concentrated means anything which is not one sun. And you say, well, how can you have more than one sun? Well, all right, let's say um, I, I have my solar panel and I put a mirror on here and I shine that mirror onto the solar panel. Now I have one sun coming down here and a second sun coming down there. Well, you can do all kinds of tricks with geometry and you can have, I've seen as high as 1,200 suns. So if one sun gets you 1,000 watts per square meter, 1,200 suns, now you're talking serious power. So CPV comes in all kinds of shapes and flavors. This is a project that we did for a company called MCOR, who started out 30, 40 years ago making solar cells for satellites in outer space. They made this. They're a semiconductor company. They make a, a one centimeter square cell, which is a gallium arsenide receiver. That is the photovoltaic cell. And they say, well, we're world experts. We are world leaders in photovoltaics in outer space. Let's terrestrialize this and see what we can do. <coughs> Excuse me. So they had the idea to create a lens that would create a 500x concentration of sun. This nine square inch lens concentrates on that one square centimeter cell and you get a 500x concentration. Now if you guys could see it on that chart I showed before that had all the different technologies, you would see that some of them talk about one sun or many suns and you get different results, okay? And so with this, you can take this rather expensive cell, use the optics to create a nine inch square of area to collect sun, concentrate it on a one centimeter square, and then make a bunch of those, create one of these, and you have a 30 kilowatt system. So that's kind of the big deal. How much more expensive is that than the normal photovoltaic? You are the winner for the day. That's the question, how much more expensive? Because at the end of the day, you're in the energy business. You're, you're selling you know, cents per kilowatt hour, right? And as it turns out, these things uh, are expensive. And people are trying to figure out how to make them cheaper. Um, in the right place, in the right application, they have logic, okay? And that logic is probably not based upon cost first. For most people, utilities, for example, which was the target for these. Um, they are more expensive. And part of the reason for that, when they began, they would have been less expensive, but the price of silicon, uh, polysilicon, crashed, went from about $400 a kilogram to about $12, 20, $24, something like that, um, to make the, uh, the silicon cells. So the economics changed, 
And these guys were kind of left out in the cold. This company right here, you can see the scale with human beings, how big these things are. Uh, I'm pretty sure this one is Amonix. Uh, and they are struggling, and uh, it, is, it is a challenge. However, uh, this was some of the work that we had done with these guys here that was in Spain. If you consider the idea that CPV means anything from two suns out through you know, over a thousand, what that means is that the geometry comes in all kinds of unbelievable shapes, configurations. And you can see some of these things here. So here is one system which is all mirrors, and mirrors are cheaper than silicon, and you have one cell up there which is a receiver. Over here you've got a receiver which is here, and there's a, a cell inside there. So the geometries that go into this are unbelievable. The, the diversity that comes with these technologies and there are hundreds and hundreds of different concentrator photovoltaics. People trying to improve the economics, which is exactly the right question to ask. <coughs> Excuse me. And, um, and to find a way to collect more photons with less expensive materials. And you can do that. Okay? And I've seen 2x and I've seen you know, 20x and 500x. So there's a lot of interesting creative things to do. Uh, as we move further down the line, this is built-in photovoltaics. This is where the future is going. It's, it's not going to be climbing on the roof and you know, dealing with putting in stanchions and putting the solar panels on it. You're going to build the house. It's going to come with solar. It's not going to be an add-on afterwards. So this is, this is where we are going. Uh, we discussed these uh, sort of built-in uh, roofing shingles already. Uh, this one on the top right has uh, solar modules built across the, uh, the entire side of the building. Uh, these, I think, are particularly beautiful. If you have been to the city of Austin um, City Hall, then you have seen built-in photovoltaics. On that little band area to the right as you walk in, you have uh, canopies like this. And these canopies are, are basically solar modules that are spaced at a certain distance to allow some light in and some light to be captured by the photovoltaics. So there's all kinds of architectural applications where you can build these things in and it doesn't make any sense to me not to build them into your building, into your home, and to, to take that energy that which is just sitting there in thin air, let's just pick it up and let's, let's use it and let's power uh, our buildings and our lives and so built-in photovoltaics is coming big time, and here's my proof. This is the Sanyo Arc right here. This tiny little building that houses, I don't know, 10,000 people, is the Sanyo World Headquarters, and they have this incredible arc out front, which is all solar energy to power their facility. So the architects can go wild and crazy and just have all kinds of fun. Um, building the photovoltaics into their facility. Um, if you do that, you're probably going to want some of these. I'm not going to get into energy storage, but it's a big and important part of this. And many people would say that it is sort of the weak link in the whole discussion today with solar energy. And there is certain truth in that discussion. Now, as far as storage goes, you have something called CSP, concentrating solar power. Concentrating solar power takes the energy of the sun, uh, let me read this out loud, it explains it fairly well. CSP systems produce heat or electricity using hundreds of mirrors to concentrate the sun's rays to a uh, temperature between 400 and 1000 degrees Celsius. Uh, all kinds of shapes and sizes and sun tracking methods, but they all work on the same principle. Individual CSP plants are now typically between 50 and 280 megawatts in size, uh, but they could be much larger. And uh, typically, they're much larger than photovoltaic. So CSP is not PV. It's a whole different thing. PV goes directly from a photon to an electron to a current to the grid. CSP takes the sun, takes that heat energy, and puts it into what is essentially a conventional power plant, which would be uh, generating steam, running it through a turbine, running a generator out to the grid. Okay. So uh, you may have seen these solar troughs. This is the most common way of doing this. The sun shines on these mirrors. It's a parabolic trough. It shines on this uh, glass tube. Inside of that is typically going to be oil because it uh, can handle that, that higher heat energy. And then that oil goes into a heat exchanger and it creates steam. 
this is the largest solar energy power plant in the world. And you know what? It ain't new. It's been sitting in Southern California in the Mojave Desert very quietly for four decades. Just quietly making solar energy. And uh, it's an enormous plant and uh, they continue to add to it. It is, the last time I noticed, 980 megawatts was the size of SEGS in the Mojave Desert. But you never hear about it. So we mentioned uh, Solucar PS10 before. This is a solar power tower, similar idea. You have all these mirrors that reflect the sun up to a receiver, right up in here. That receiver uh, commonly would be molten salt, and you're capturing that heat energy, then you go through a heat exchanger, make steam, on and on. Now, one of the nice things about this is what people always complain about solar energy. Well, you can only make energy when the sun shines. Horse hockey. That's just not true. That is just not true. Any of these CSP systems, they can make heat energy and they can store heat energy. And some of these guys, depending upon what the designers wanted it to do, can provide uh, solar energy for up to five days. So if the sun doesn't shine, if it's raining out, you still got solar energy and life is good. Here's an aerial view. Uh, in the front is uh, PS10, the back is PS20, 10 and 20 megawatt. Uh, reflecting systems. Those are both in uh, Andalusia, Spain. Uh, all different kinds of geometry. Again, same kind of thing with the CPV. You get all kinds of geometry ways to have mirrors and to collect the energy. And it all always comes down to what is the cost of that system versus what it produces. So there's a lot of games there. This one's a bit different. This is on the border between uh, mm. Spain and France. This is a solar furnace. It collects solar energy. You can see some of the mirrors out here and it points it to this great big parabolic dish, and uh, they get temperatures in the three and a half thousand degrees Celsius range, and they can use it for making energy, but they can also use it for all kinds of massive scientific study, where there's just not a lot of places where you can get temperatures like this, and uh, there is um, not quite this, but something that's a solar power tower out in Sandia National Labs. And I was out there one day, and touring and talking to people about this, and they were doing some testing. And um, what they were testing were the heat shields for the space shuttle. Because as it turns out, there's no place in the world where you can get enough heat energy to test the heat shield on the space shuttle other than the sun. And you combine it and combine it and combine it, and then you generate enough heat energy so that they can actually emulate the, the re-entry into our atmosphere and you watch the ablation of the, of the heat shield as it burns away and just loses itself and the next layer burns away. And uh, that's what they were doing. They were working, practicing, studying these heat shields using this kind of, of scientific study mechanism. Every once in a while, <laughs> We were watching this thing, and you couldn't really look at it too well. You kind of had to have dark glasses or something. But we're watching this thing. Every once in a while, you see this big flash. And, and I just said, gosh, what's that? Bug. <laughs> and he said, yeah, you ought to see what a bird flies through. It's not pretty. <laughs> so yeah, that's, uh, you know, talk about you know, laser beams, photon beams, lightsabers. This is, you know, this is one hell of a serious lightsaber <clears throat> right here. Um, I talked about storage. This is important because you can store solar energy as heat and use it later on when you need it overnight, rainy days. So that's CSP. You mentioned solar thermal before. Solar thermal to me is something different and it, it does not involve CSP. Sterling Engines, and this was a company called Sterling Energy Systems, which the economics did not work for them and they have gone away. <coughs> They're using a Sterling engine and a Sterling engine is one of the most simple bits of um, of magic uh, that you can make. And up here you have a reciprocating engine and it gets hot on one side and expands and then it gets cold and then it gets hot on the other side and it expands. And so they're taking the energy from the sun here, reflecting it up into there, and they're cycling this thing back and forth and they're making a generator out of it in order to create that electricity. Here's another one, simplest thing in the world. Simplest thing in the world. Anybody ever seen a hot air balloon? Of course you have, right? Well, you make hot air, it goes up, these guys are making hot air down at the bottom. There's about eight feet between the ground and these panels. The sun comes through, heats up the air underneath here. The air gets directed up this big long tube and you have a 
old-fashioned airplane propeller inside there. Kind of looks, uh, kind of looks like this. There's a turbine in there. That moving air created by the sun's energy then turns and it makes electricity. So this is almost like a, a, a kids, a kids thing you could do at you know, fun fun things to do in the summertime with your kid. Um, solar water heating. This has become pretty. <clears throat> reasonably common here in the US. Other places in the world it is absolutely common. You wouldn't even consider not having a house without solar water heating. It probably is not even allowed by law that you could do that. Other applications uh, of solar water heating, um, heating your hot tub, heating your pool, um, heating you know your, your greenhouse and such as that. Uh, solar uh, water heating, this is a whole different kind of application. It's called a trome wall, T-R-O-M-B-E. In this case, you've got the sun comes in, it shines on a wall, and in that wall you've got water containers. Picture 55-gallon drums filled with water on end, stacked up. And the sun shines on it, and then at night you open an inside curtain, essentially, and all of that heat just dumps out into your house at night, and the sun you know, heats your house all night long. It works very nicely. This lady. She really appreciates that solar energy. And uh, again, you know, fun with kids in summertime uh, um, camps, you can go do this. And I've seen out here in Michael's parking lot the, uh, the guys uh, who will cook you a pizza using solar energy uh, directly. So there you go. Um, those are some of the more commercial technologies. Now discussing general solar technology. When I was a kid, I loved this picture. I went to Kitty Hawk. I read the books about the Wright brothers. I love this picture. I love that one, too. That is a solar-powered drone. It will go up, and it will never come down. It does not need to come down ever, ever, ever. That, in case you're worried about the NSA, is not necessarily good news, <laughs> but that's a fact. These things are being used in uh, military theaters, but they're also good for all kinds of other theaters. Anywhere you could have, you know, a, a drone application, which is everything from agriculture to, you know, traffic patterns, all kinds of stuff. It just goes up, it stays up, and it's just happy as can be. This one's called the Zephyr, um, <coughs> the official endurance record for an unmanned aerial vehicle. Uh, this is back in 2010, so this is an older slide, uh, and they continue to get better every day. What about <coughs> this guy? Um, this is actually a manned uh, aircraft, totally 100% solar powered. This is called the Solar Impulse, and uh, if you were paying attention to the news for these kind of things like I was, you saw that it landed in Dallas oh, three, four months ago in its cross-country trip going across the United States, and um, this, this was a big deal. Uh, this, the, the, the last picture had one pilot, this one has two. <coughs> Uh, especially as they go long distances. And the next goal is to go around the world, totally solar powered. And, uh, and this gives you an idea. There's an Airbus A380 and there's the Solar Impulse. The A380 holds a few more passengers than the Solar Impulse does. That's meaningful, of course. So what about other applications? On the left, you see a, uh, a high-speed uh, uh, motorboat, solar powered. On the right, you see a <coughs> sailboat, which is also solar powered. And I don't mean by the wind here. I mean by the solar pa panels here. And interestingly to me, this is, this is fine, but you have this surface area. So third takeaway for the day. You see surface area, you think solar collection. Surface area, solar collection. Surface area, he missed. <laughs> But, you know, those are just sailboats. What if you want to get really serious, really big, big honking serious, like this? And I said that the Solar Impulse was working on traveling around the world. Well, they're too late. These guys have already done it. They've already gone around the world on the power of the sun. It is a solar-powered ship, and it only has power from solar. And it left uh, Monaco uh, in southern France, and it traveled around the world, and it's now back, and it is, uh, I think, actually just completing a scientific mission in the uh, north central Atlantic where it has the unique ability <coughs> to do things that almost any other vessel can't because it is not making diesel engine noise as it does scientific study. 
because it's really quiet. Anybody who drives a Chevy Volt or a Tesla, they can attest to the difference in driving something with an engine and driving something without an engine. So this one is called the Turinor uh, MS Turinor Planet Solar. And if we have any real geeks in here, Turinor uh, comes from the Lord of the Rings. So um, extending that now below, I talked about aerial drones. Uh, you now have drones that go underwater. And uh, they can be used to go as deep in the ocean as you want, do any kind of research and snooping and bugging and data collection and organizing and fixing cables and all kinds of things. And then they come back up to the surface and they charge themselves up in the sun. And then off they go. What about? Um, Getting a little bit more pedestrian now, solar clothing. You know, we hear about wearables. This is becoming a, a big discussion of wearables. Well, you know, having solar clothing which will charge your phone, all of us have been someplace where our phone died, and gosh, it would have been nice if I could just walk along and collect solar energy out of thin air and charge my phone or my laptop. Imagine how important this is if you're the US military and if you've ever listened to these discussions as to how many electrically powered devices a warfighter takes into the theater today, it's stunning. It's like 12 to 16 powered devices. I'm not talking about the uh, M16, I'm talking about their laptop and their GPS and their cell phone and God knows what other stuff they've got. These all take energy and these guys literally carry piles of D-cell batteries. That's what they do. And that's, that's craziness. And the Army knows it's craziness, which is why the Defense Energy Summit and the Defense Energy Center of Excellence got so much attention because the Army runs on energy. The reason that Hitler was defeated in Russia was because he was trying to make his way to Stalingrad because there are oil fields there. The military runs on energy. If they can take their energy out of thin air, that's a really, really good deal. If you ask any soldier that you know how many people were killed on oil delivery convoys shipping tanker trucks full of oil through the Khyber Pass, and how many of those people got killed, it's a stunning amount. Googaws around your house, I like the idea of lighted sidewalks, actually. I think that's pretty cool. You could do the same thing with the lights down the middle of the highway, all solar powered, pick it up ambient. Here's all kinds of Googaws, a solar powered uh, vacuum cleaner, solar powered desk, the old joke about it's an Aggie solar-powered flashlight, well, that's real today. You can go buy one. Um, these things are getting close to, um, close to where I think they should be, but this has driven me crazy for years. I have this, and I have this. Why the hell is that not a solar panel to charge my phone so I don't ever have to run out of energy in my, in my phone? Well, today, Apple has just patented, last week, a, a solar-powered laptop and uh, you can actually see things like this. Samsung has one, Apple has some, and uh, these things are coming. Uh, solar powered keyboards, the batteries on my keyboard are dying. I'm too lazy to change them, and I keep getting irritated on my keyboard, but if I had this, I wouldn't be irritated. So future solar technology, this is the last section. I know this is the future because Walmart is here. <laughs> <laughs> now Walmart doesn't do this because they're nice guys, they're green guys, they're thinking environmentally. They do this because it saves them money. If Walmart has done the math and said, this is a good deal, this is gonna save us money, holy cow, I know that we're just about to fall over the cliff in terms of solar energy becoming the standard and not the exception. Uh, and this is not, by the way, some you know, green fruits and vegetables uh, you know, law out in California. This is Hungary. Walmart is the world's largest um, commercial solar installation on an aggregated basis. But what about this? This is, this is my office. This is where I think the future is going. Transportation is going to be all based upon driving on sunshine. I know that's true because we've had these things for years. That's the UT car winning some race somewhere. Um, this works. This is not hugely impressive, but you've got to start somewhere. <laughs> this is not bad. Solar Prius, and they used it to cool the cabin. Well, okay, that's a step, but it's not hugely impressive. Fisker came out with a much more impressive looking car. The roof is all solar panels. Fisker didn't work, they're out of business. But the idea is there. 
And here comes Ford with their C-Max energy concept. So Ford puts those same solar cells in their roof. They're using sun power, the most efficient cells, 23.5% conversion efficient. And they're doing this. I talked about concentrators before. Ford is using a concentrator to concentrate that solar energy on the solar panels so that you can actually fully charge your whole car and you don't need the gas at all. You drive on the sunshine. That's where it's coming and these are some future visions of cars that are doing that. So I take this future vision and I look at this. Remember, lesson three. You see surface area, you think solar. Why the heck are we driving FedEx trucks and postal vehicles on diesel fuel? In five years from now, you're going to think this is the stupidest thing I ever heard. Especially FedEx trucks that drive for 50 yards and stop, and 50 yards and stop, and 50 yards and stop. And what about these guys? The same thing, okay? The most amount of energy you need is when you start from a dead stop. Electric powered motors just love that. You get full torque, man, that, that you know, Tesla proves that real fast. So these things very quickly are going to have solar panels all up and down the sides and on the roof. They will power themselves, no more diesel stuff. That's just nasty, annoying, loud, who needs it? Um, <clears throat> out in space, 1,366 watts per square meter. The Japanese are very energy starved. They have no energy resources locally other than whatever wind and sun and tidal they can collect. So the Japanese are looking at going into outer space where there's more solar energy and beaming it back to Japan. That, by the way, creates world peace because everybody has access to their own energy. Hybrid solar wearables, uh, these things are coming. This is, um, uh, I think, oh gosh, I don't remember now the size. I think this is a four kilowatt um, power source. It's the size of a toaster. And this will power your house in the future. A company in North Austin, MTPV, is making these things. And my count, I think, was four orders of magnitude more energy dense energy conversion than this solar panel sitting right here. This is about 0 0.05 watts per square centimeter. This is 50 watts per square centimeter of energy conversion. Four orders of magnitude. North Austin, here today, not commercial, can't buy it yet. Um, organic solar. Um, uh, a lot of activity going on here, just using organic matter and taking out some of the other chemicals. Professor at UT doing rust. And you know that solar energy has finally really made it when you see this. <laughs> <laughs> this is real. It's a solar powered bikini. You too can be the first on your block to have one of these and power your iPod from your bikini. Thank you so much. <laughs>